NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to The Source. The NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the biggest storylines with comments from key guests in the college and high school NIL space. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future to, you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Every year, thousands of human remains are found in the United States. And in one of every four instances, authorities can't identify the body. That's starting to change. I'm Dave Killen, co-host of The Unidentifieds, a new limited series podcast from The Oregonian and Oregon Live. We go deep into several cold cases and explain the science that's helping experts give these long-forgotten people their names back. Look for The Unidentifieds after you've finished listening to this podcast. Subscribe to The Unidentifieds on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello and welcome back to Sports by Northwest, supported by the Pacific Automation 147, coming June 2nd and 3rd to Portland International Raceway. I am Bill Oram, columnist at the Oregonian and Oregon Live. Big, big things happening for the Portland Trailblazers, potentially next week. The NBA lottery coming up, and the Blazers, of course, do have that 10.5% chance of getting the number one pick and the and the right to draft uh, French superstar Victor Wembanyama. Um, going to determine the course of this Blazers offseason and beyond. And so to discuss that and what that could mean for Damian Lillard, I'm turning to one of the sharpest, smartest observers of the NBA, um, somebody whose work I suspect you are familiar with. Uh, welcoming in today, Howard Beck, longtime NBA reporter at places like the New York Times, Sports Illustrated, Bleacher Report, and like me, the Los Angeles News Group, where we are both veterans of the very casual and relaxed Los Angeles Lakers beat. Howard, how are you? <laughs> Doing well, Bill. Great to talk to you. Great to see you. Even if the listeners may not see that we can see each other. Uh, great to uh, great to hang virtually. It's been a while. Uh, this is very inside baseball or very inside uh, basketball writing. Um, but Howard, you might be the person I communicate with the most while saying the least, because you and I, <laughs> because you and I are both uh, are are both loyal uh, users of the New York Times crossword app and the various word games that are are inside that, and uh, we like to. You mean to spelling bee addicts? What you meant is sp- addicts. Spelling bee addicts. I do you actually do the crossword too, or do you? Um, I'm, do, do you stick to the sp- spelling bee and the mini? I've never been a big crossword guy. Um, my wife is really good at the crossword puzzles at the time on the Times app. I have dabbled in the crossword puzzles. Uh, I, we, we are now doing, you know, I'm doing the mini, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but the big crossword, especially later in the week, it's just, it's too much for my brain. And the spelling bee consumes an already uh, stupid amount of my time in a given day, probably, and my mental capacity. So um, I'm just going to stick with that for now. Yeah, I can't, I can't do both. I can. I've, I go through stretches where I'm a, 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 a crossword person. Um, or, or the spelling bee. I did briefly dabble with Sudoku and I've never been a numbers person. Um, Mm -hmm. but I, I I think I have to stay away. You know what? Uh, This is, this is, here's a, here's a funny, uh, like a moment in time type of reference in my earlier years, traveling on the beat, covering the Lakers from 97 to 04. And then on the Knicks from 04 to about 2013, my heavy, heavy travel years (laughs) was also back before we had smartphones for a lot of that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you'd get on a plane, and if you did have any devices, you couldn't turn them on anyway. And that was when you still, you said Sudoku. It just reminded me, when did I play Sudoku? When it was in the back of the freaking airport mm-hmm. airplane magazine, when there still were airplane magazines. American Airlines had one, United had one, Delta, had, and it would sit there in that <laughs> in the back pocket, and you'd pull it out, this tattered magazine that God knows how many people have rifled through. <laughs> Pages are stuck together from, like, their <laughs> snacks that they ate on the last flight, whatever. And if nobody had done the Sudoku yet at the back there, yeah, maybe I can burn an hour or so on, on the flight. I can't remember doing Sudoku since then. It's so funny because uh, this is like very much tales from the road, but I did, 
my version of that was that the Delta magazine like had the crossword puzzle as well. And so I would, I remember one time doing the crossword puzzle and like laboring through it and getting it done. And then I had a layover in Atlanta and I got on a new plane with the same in-flight magazine. And so I then raced through it and did it as fast as possible. And the person next to me was like, wow. And I was like, I know, I'm just really good at crossword puzzles. I can actually vouch for the fact that you are in fact extremely good at crossword puzzles, especially the times mini, which you sometimes do in like 3.4 seconds, which pisses, <laughs> pisses me off, but whatever. All right. The enough of that problem. Of minis. Okay. So talking about numbers games, uh, yes. let's talk, let's talk about the NBA lottery on Tuesday. Uh, it's in Chicago. Um, the NBA has done something cool, which is that the lottery now precedes the combine. So the combine, yeah. which comes right on the heels of the lottery, I'll be there for that. And like, now it's like, you know, maybe what range of player you're going to want to talk to um, depend for what team you cover. So for the Blazers can have a sense of whether I should be trying to chase down guys who are going to be in the five to seven range, uh, three to five, you know, Victor's not going to be there, Victor Weminyama, but um, Howard, there seems to be a real um, sense that this is a lottery that could, is going to alter the, you know, the future of the NBA. Um, what, what is kind of your perspective on, on kind of this moment, um, for, for the league? And is it, is it just that Wembenyama is so good or are there other pieces to it too? No, I think it's mostly about Victor Wembenyama with all due respect to Scoot Henderson and Brandon Miller and anybody else. I mean, it's Wembenyama. This reminds me of, and it's a version of, right? These are not all equivalent, but it reminds me of all the hype going into the Zion draft, maybe Mm -hmm. the Anthony Davis draft, the LeBron draft, right? And there aren't that many of these. You know, you get one every 10 years or so where the entire league is saying, man, whoever gets this guy, they are set. This is a guy who is going to change a franchise, potentially change the balance of power in the league. It's going to set up a franchise for years and years to come. Um, You know, it's funny because... Some of the guys who are, in fact, trajectory changers in the current NBA, right? Think of the last five MVP winners in a row, right? Two by um, uh, Giannis, two by um, uh, Jokic, and now Embiid. One all international, of course, as Wimbanyama is as well. So we have that trend going. But also, like, Giannis was the 15th overall pick. Mm -hmm. Jokic was a second round pick. Embiid was, what, third? Third. I think third. So... But at the time he's coming in and it was like, oh yeah, sure. He's this like really intriguing big man, but he's still got some, some development to do. And he's got back issues and foot issues and mm. all this stuff. And then early on in his career, it was work ethic issues. So the guys who have truly dominated the league over the last five seasons, you know, three guys in particular, and then Luca, who is, is emerging in this again, another international guy, but Luca wasn't the top overall pick either. Mm. So I, when I said, when we talk about women, Yama being this, this transcendent, League changing, power balance changing uh, presence. It's only because it's more obvious for him now coming in as the clear number one. Whereas some of the guys who actually have changed the league over the last half decade mm-hmm. or so, just you just didn't know it at the time. If we knew that it was that Giannis would be this guy, that that Luca would be this guy, that Jokic would be this guy, that Embiid we would have talked about those drafts differently. So I just wanted that as a Mm. quick perspective point, but everybody in the league, of course, looks at women in the same way, which is with that combination of size and skill and fluidity. um, It's funny because we, you know, Porzingis was the guy that Durant dubbed the unicorn and we've had various versions of unicornish type Mm -hmm. players, six, 10 to seven footers or seven over seven feet with ball skills or perimeter skills, shooting skills. But like Porzingis himself was actually kind of gawky even at his prime when he made an all-star team early on for the Knicks. Um, When you watch Wembenyama, there is nothing about him that seems gawky. There's nothing that seems unnatural for a guy who's, who's well over seven feet. He just, there's a grace to him that reminds me more of Kevin Durant, who he is in fact taller than. Um, So yeah. uh, Do do we know how tall Kevin Durant is? Like, (laughs) We, Kevin we'll, Durant, fi- we'll find Ke- out next season when they're side by side. Ke- uh, Kevin Durant is the uh, falls in the category of six foot twelve, I believe. <laughs> um, it's like it's like Garnett. Like Garnett never wanted to be called a seven footer, even though he's pretty much seven feet. Durant's like, oh no, I'm I'm like six nine or something. no, no, you're not. You're, you're seven feet. We've seen we've seen you standing next to seven footers. Well, it, it, it's interesting just talking about kind of the the uncertainty of of you know what these players are going to become and and kind of the crapshoot of the draft. I covered the Jazz uh, in 2013 during that draft when Giannis did come out and went 15th. 
and the Jazz uh, acquired the 27th pick from Denver to to draft Rudy Gobert, who they were really, really high on. But he was the 27th pick. And Howard, in fact, I, I know I know for a fact you were at the Orlando Summer League in 2013 when Rudy Gobert played. I don't know if you have distinct memories of this, but he was one of the more awkward players I've ever seen. I mean, he was so long, so, so lanky. And then there was one play where somebody shot a wild shot just, you know, in the general vicinity of the basket. And Rudy Gobert went up and blocked it about a good two feet above the above the box on the backboard. And everybody was like, oh. And so it's like with so many of these guys, you see flashes and you see potential. With Victor, it seems like you see a finished pro- – not maybe not a, not a finished product by any means, but a an NBA-ready product. And the only questions you yeah. really have would be about his build at this point. Is that he, fair? He looks – yeah, yeah, no, he looks he looks ready in all sorts of ways, and he's done things. You know, you know, most of us haven't watched a ton other than clips that have come over. And yeah, mm-hmm. you know, like we watched when he and Scoot Henderson played against each other um, during the showcase back in December. Mm-hmm. And um, but you just see some of the, the the clips you see, like he's doing things that just should not even be possible. Right. Um, and for a guy his size, in, in particular, so I, I think there's an NBA readiness um, aspect of this. There's the, just the basic combination, right? Everybody loves to have a really tall guy who can, you know, has, has the, the, uh, skills to play anywhere on the floor who can block shots at the other end and who seems agile enough to probably guard multiple positions. And like, that's, that's the Holy grail in today's NBA, a really tall guy who can do all that stuff. And so he does look ready. There will be issues about or concerns about, you know, body and um, ability to, to withstand it all. But, you know, Kevin Durant went through all that early on, too. Right. Like it was, oh, oh what, he, what can he bench press and all this stupidity? Yeah. Um, but that said, probably, I, probably why he didn't go number one overall. Something that we're a little I'd little have no recollection about bringing of, up on this podcast. <laughs> no recollection of that happening. I wouldn't even discuss it. Um, so, you know, I, I do. I have heard people kind of try to push gently on the on the idea of is he too big of a risk because of body type um does he does he going to hold up and and, you know we also do know again i don't mean to hit sore spots uh for your audience but there is a history in this league of you know seven footers or guys well over seven feet who don't Mm -hmm. hold up um foot issues hip issues knee issues whatever it may be and um but you can't i I, the, the scouts and executives who are assessing Wembenyama, I think their feeling is like you can't go there. You can't, you just know what he could present to you on day one and what his potential mm-hmm. could be as a as an absolute game changer. You can't start getting into unless there's a medical record that that has totally. red flags, you don't try to project forward and say, well, seven footers often have these issues, or well, this guy's so skinny and the way he moves might put his body at re- Yeah, sure, all those things are possible, but those, you know, and, 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 you know, you could look at Zion Williamson as, as a, a very, very, very different body type, but who also on day one, you thought one, I can't pass him up, but two, yeah, there are some health concerns or, or physique concerns on day one. Okay. But everybody in the league still would have drafted Zion number one and everybody in the league would draft Wembenyama number one. There's no question. Yeah. And, and, and so from a Portland perspective and just for, for our listeners, the Blazers have the fifth, have the fifth, fifth best odds at the number one pick. Um, they are behind Detroit, Houston, and San Antonio, who all have 14% by virtue of being the three worst teams in the league. Charlotte is at 12.5%, and then the Blazers at 10.5%. So, I mean, it's a very realistic jump. I mean, you know, you can sit on tankathon.com if you are someone who hasn't done that yet. You can hit the, the, the lottery sim simulator, you know, 55 times, or you do it 100 times, the Blazers will probably get the number one pick 10 times. Um, and and so your mind does go there, and it's not a total leap. Um, but, Howard, when you look at Portland – and kind of the forces at play for the Trailblazers and this commitment they've made to Damian Lillard over the last 11 years. They gave him the extension last year that is going to make him one of the highest paid players um, in in the league. In, in, among in, His current contract sets him up to be the highest paid player in league history. Does, um, <clears throat> does Wembenyama make sense for the Damian Lillard uh, – construction of the blazers like can you sort of do both things if 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 you if you strike if you do if you do win the lottery that 10.5 percent comes true does damian lillard and victor Wembanyama make sense together 
While you were setting up this question, I went to Tankathon, clicked Sim Lottery four times, and on the fourth try, I got Portland at number one. So there you go. Um, it is possible. Um, the fun 25% thing about the lo- according to howardbeck.tankathon.com. Yeah, there you, there you go. Um, it only took four tries. Uh, so they have a 42% chance, the Blazers, of a top four pick. But this is interesting, mm-hmm. too, right? Like a quick, quick just uh, primer here for people as they're getting ready for Tuesday night. They have almost an equal chance, the Blazers, of, go, of, of, of drafting or, or landing first, second, or third. Those are all the 10.5% uh, range. There's only a 2.2% chance in these weird odds that they've done uh, of them being fourth. Their highest chance by far is falling to six, mm-hmm. <laughs> 26.7, 19.6% chance of staying at five. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I, look, they're they're probably going to draft somewhere in the top four um, or five. Uh, and I know there are other interesting players. To me, Wembenyama is the only one where you have clarity. If you get Wembenyama, and assuming that Damian Lillard has not changed his stance on wanting to be there till retirement, yeah, I would I would start to talk myself into the idea that Lillard and Wembenyama, plus you know whatever. A development from Simons and, and Sharp and and whatever. Maybe we're bringing back Jeremy Grant and maybe we flip Nurkic for somebody else. And what? Now I'm talking myself into we have extended the Dame Lillard era. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 you now have a runway beyond it. Yes, and a runway beyond it. You have you have the ideal scenario, not quite ideal. Ideally, it would be Wembenyama, this version of Wembenyama, but like with Dame four years younger or something, mm-hmm. right? But but you have an ability to make yourself relevant again immediately and have a bridge to the post Dame Lillard era of the Blazers. Fantastic. I think there's also a very compelling argument to be made there though, that if you get Wembenyama, that gives you clearance to now trade Damian Lillard because Mm -hmm. you're, they they are obviously on vastly, vastly different timelines. And if you had the ability to surround Wembenyama with younger players and, 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 be able to bring back players and picks and, you know, whatever that platinum package is, the Rudy Gobert type package, the Donovan Mitchell type package, the Kevin Durant type package, whatever you can get for Lillard. And he's, all these situations are different. Every negotiation is different, but whatever you could get back for him, does that kickstart the next era, you know, now around Wembenyama as your North star instead? And I think that there's a compelling argument to be made for that too, but I've said, and I'll stay more or less consistent with this. I will probably hedge on it later in our discussion. I, I generally believe then when it comes to the Blazers and Damian Lillard that you don't trade him unless he says he wants out and you, you respect that if he wants to stay, he stays. You respect that if he wants to go, he goes. He means that much to the franchise. Um, he's, he's that important. He's, he's earned that. And, you know, as long as he's still consistently saying, I want to stay, I, I, I don't want to be the guy who traded him other than under the circumstances of him saying it's time for me to go. Um, so that's, so that's tough, but if they're fortunate enough to get the number one pick that that's a really interesting two sides of the discussion, right? Is it, is it the, we we've now saved the present or is it the, it's time to pivot to the future. And I think that in general, trying to be on two tracks in the NBA doesn't really work yeah, or make sense. That's the Warriors. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's interesting. I had a conversation a couple months ago with a, a, um, a general manager, an NBA general manager about this exact question. And what that person said was it was, it was, it was and, and this, and this person took the latter track that you're talking about, which is the, the, you would be more, you'd feel more inclined to move on from Dame and get everything sort of aligned around Wembenyama. You go young, you go assets. And then you, you look at this as the 10 year window with Wembenyama and forget about any kind of like three year window with Lillard. And like the scenario that this GM threw out was, you know, could you flip, and I don't think Blazer fans are going to like this, but this is just sort of as a concept or a philosophy, trade Damian Lillard to Atlanta for Trey, Trey Young. So you're not doing the assets. You're not doing the picks. You're not doing, you're not doing, you know, prospects. You get an all-star caliber player, you know, with, with his flaws for sure. But Atlanta's very much in win now mode with what they, you know, where they've put their money and, and with, with DeJounte Murray and you get Trey Young, who is, you know, at least from an age standpoint, much closer to the Victor Wembanyama. um, uh, timeline, but you're not doing a full reset where you, where you have to suck. And so like conceptually that makes some sense to me. I don't have the fondness for Trey young to think that you 
you pulled that exact deal. But that is sort of the third route, I guess, of, you know, you're trading Dame, but you're not necessarily going all in on the um, on the asset driven rebuild. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Trey is the guy I would target, but I mean, mm-hmm. it, it is. It's I would have some hesitation there, um, but but there, but it is something along those lines, right? It is if you're gonna go that that route, um, uh, yes, uh, you're you're, and the th- let me use we'll use Trey as the stand-in for a second. The good thing about Trey would be it's a younger player who is closer to women Yama's timeline, but who is already in the league long enough to kind of know the ropes. Um, I don't know that he's necessarily the guy I want Wembenyama mentored by, but again, but, uh, but, but it's the right idea in terms of mm-hmm. like, Hey, somebody who's, who's already established their ability to be an all-star in this league and, um, and, and gives you a little bit more reliability while your, your, your incredible young prospect is learning the ropes, right? It's going to take some time. Wembenyama is going to have, a learning curve like anybody else. He's probably mm-hmm. not dominating on day one. Very few do. Uh, who knows? He could, he could, he could turn that on its head, <laughs> but I, do, but I think you want to do whatever you can. So, the, and this is, by the way, this is the problem with, with entertaining the, the trade Dame scenarios. If you got Wembenyama, I think for the sake of developing your youth in general, in this league, as talented as Wembenyama or anybody else coming in might be Anthony Davis on day one, a lot of guys on day mm-hmm. one, putting too much on them, because that's usually how it goes, right? The worst sure. teams draft high, and now it's you're, you you're plus very little talent. Yeah, right. Be- come save us. Come be come be the franchise savior. That's a lot to shoulder on day one, and it it sometimes puts guys in in in, in tough positions, and then they they maybe start learning bad habits because they're they're you know forcing the issue too much uh, in terms of sh- of their sh- their shots. I. I I think there's a lot to be said for having a stable veteran cast, but you can do that. You can manufacture that a variety of ways. And again, the theoretical Dame return might not have to be at an all-star level. It could just be a bunch of picks and at least one young player and some veterans, whatever. There's a lot of configurations, but you can also use free agency to rebuild the roster Mm -hmm. so that you have a solid group around a Wembenyama. Um, So there's a lot of different ways you could go there. Sure. And I, I do like the idea, like even you saying mentorship, right? I think about Damian Lillard, who is the consummate pro in, in the NBA and who understands the city, understands the franchise. Um, you know, the idea of there being a sort of passing of the torch and those two playing together, because I would suspect that by year two, or year three, when Binyama is kind of ready to rock, right? Like yeah. it is, I mean, I think I agree. I mean, rookies as a general rule, like don't expect too much from at least a team success and impact sense from somebody right. who's 19 years old and, and going through this for the first time, who's never played a game at Madison square garden. Um, but I would assume that that's going to be a relatively short, um, you know, turnaround for, for women Yama, which does like we talked about kind of fit both, both, um, both needs. So I, I do, I think, I think where I would land on this is you absolutely give the Dame women Yama thing a try for a year. And then maybe you reevaluate in a year, see how Dame feels about it. But like, yeah, and and maybe that maybe you lose a little bit of value in in terms of Dame Dame on the trade market because he'll be going into his you know age thirty, he's almost thirty three now, so he'll be going into age thirty four in another year, and so that all gets you know the and the contract gets bigger. Um, there's different factors there, but I think I would be intrigued enough by the prospect of Dame and Victor that I'd want to see it. I have a couple of other other quick thoughts on on this before I, I lose my my train of thought on it. Um, okay. One is that a lot of this dep- just depends on like Damien's patience right now, right, and his outlook. So, um, if if he if you get Wembenyama and and Dame himself says this is reason to stay, then again back to my pr- previous premise: if he doesn't want out, then don't trade him. Um, but as we as we were just discussing, it takes some time for a rookie to get up to speed. Does does Dame look at it and say? man, by the time he's really ready to dominate, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, pushing 36, whatever, yeah. 36 years old. Like it, it's so that he, he might see it differently. And so again, I, I'm, I'm going to be, as I'm sure they are checking in with him at every, at every step of the way here. And you know, how do you feel about that? Um, my other thought in this, the, in the, in the shortest of the short term, here's my glass half full theory for the Blazers in general. However, the lottery goes. The West is in like severe flux right now. So look at the final four in the in the West. Um, the Suns just went down in flames, and they're it's shaky, right? Like Durant can't get through a full season. 
they've got a lot of holes to patch up. They may be trading DeAndre Ayton. They may be trading Chris Paul. They, you know, like the Suns have a lot of work to do despite having that Durant Booker tandem. The Warriors and Lakers, that series, you know, is, is hanging in the balance as you and I speak. The Lakers could be trending down after this. The Warriors mm-hmm. could be trending down after this. The Clippers are always hurt. The Grizzlies are good, not great, and they've got their mm-hmm. flaws. The Kings, also good, not great, but on the rise. Wolves, Thunder, Pelicans. I mean, it's just, aside from Denver, who are looking pretty good right now to go to the finals, there's not a lot of, like, it, it's just it's just a, a, a morass of of teams in flux and mediocrity and injury concerns and age concerns and all this stuff, right? Like a healthy Dame plus, whether it's Wimbanyama or Dame plus trading the pick, if, it, if it's not the number one pick, um, a couple of moves, you, you could be right back in the thick of things because the mm-hmm. West is just that transitional right now. What, um, how do you view um, trading? A, I think we are in agreement that it would be ludicrous to even entertain the idea of trading the number one pick if that were to happen. But as no, we if you know, get Wembenyama, you absolutely positively are keeping Wembenyama. Yeah, Dude, I, like, I don't care what timelines, things, what a Dame stuff, what, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't care. There are no circumstances under which I would trade the number one pick if I got it in this draft, whether I'm the Blazers or anybody else. Thank you. But there is an 89.5% chance the Blazers won't get Wembenyama, which could right. ultimately render this conversation uh, academic. Um, but as you noted, decent chance at 2, 3, 4, um, 6, 7. <laughs> but if we operate, where are your tiers in terms of how aggressive the Blazers should be with trading a pick? I mean, I, I would read you the quote from Damian Lillard from his exit interview about um, his patience for taking on another 19-year-old player, a la Shaden Sharp. I just ain't interested in that. Being honest, this is not a secret. I want a chance to go for it. If the route is to do that, that's not my route. So Victor Wembanyama, we're going to put in his own category, but Scoot Henderson, 19, point guard. Uh, Brandon Miller, 20. Um, you know, And then you get into the Thompson Twins probably and Cam Whitmore are probably the rest of the 5-6. F- um, if you're the Blazers, do you feel an urgency to trade out of 2-3 four, five, six, seven. And, and how do you view that? So, you know, every front office has its own evaluations, obviously Mm -hmm. about guys in that range and about, you know, everybody, everybody believes firmly that Wembenyama is a guy you can build an entire team around for years to come. Scoot Thompson twins, Miller, these other guys, like the Blazers may see them in a certain way. Like they might see one of those guys and say, if we're in a position to take him, we think we could build around that guy. This guy's actually underrated. This guy is in fact a franchise. And by the way, every year there are guys who emerge as in fact, franchise stars, all NBA talents, MVP types who are not number one, two or three, who are five or 15 or whatever. We just talked about some of them before. So some of this depends on the Blazers internal evaluation of, of that grouping. But I, I'll say this, if you just think those guys are like good, but not franchise changers, and if Dame is still staying on course with, I want to stay and compete and get back to relevance here, then I think it's automatic. You trade it. But I thought that last year too. Like I thought last year was the moment where you should have traded the pick if you're the mm-hmm. Blazers to, to help Dame immediately. And that was what? Eighth? Where were they? Seventh. Seventh. Yeah. Um, so I, I already believed that they should have been in that mode. Yeah. And I already am of the belief that Dame and Anthony Simons is just another version of Dame and CJ McCollum. Yep. And like, they're just agreed. So I don't, I, I can't exactly endorse the idea of Dame plus Scoot Henderson, who's six, two and Scoot is like, by the way, like super athletic, super strong. Um, and, and maybe that, maybe that works, but you're still, it's still an undersized backcourt. It's still another primary ball handler. You know, I don't think that Scoot Henderson's you know outside shot is good enough yet to to say, well, you can play him off the ball, and like, no, you know, Dame is the one who can play off the ball, but you don't want Dame playing off the ball that much. So you're you're right back to another one of these. And besides that, if you're drafting him, are you then trading Anthony Simons? Maybe. Um, so I, my general view, and I am not a scout, and I and I have spent much less time than the people who are actually paid to do this, looking at all these prospects outside of Wembenyama. My, my, you know, bird's eye view of this is if you get Wimbanyama, you keep it. If you, if you get anybody else, if you're in any other position, two, three, four, five, whatever, 
you trade it if Dame is staying because that pick is going to be far more valuable to some other team. And if you can get back immediate help, as I was just laying out about the West, you could get back in business pretty quickly because that pick is going to be super valuable to somebody else. Um, but again, like you are sacrificing some of the future for the presence in that case, mm -hmm. uh, for the present, I should say in that case. Um, I don't know. I, I, I started playing around with like, all right, so where would I send that pick? The two, three, four, five, wherever. Mm -hmm. um, is is there a is there a trade involving like Simons in the pick that 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 gets you back DeAndre Ayton and some stuff? I don't know. Ay Ayton is supposedly in play now, right? Mm -hmm. Is there is there is there and some, some scenario? And, there, here? and there's been and there's been some interest from Portland in him in the in the past. That is a yeah. name that is very right. familiar to Blazers. You, you need target right. You need bigs and you need defense and you know like he's he's a he's a pretty good you know uh, pretty good two way center. Um, are the Clippers staying the course with Paul George and Kawhi, who are both going to the last year of their deals and are extension eligible? Is there, you know, is one of those guys available? Dame plus Paul George would be kind of interesting. Um, what are the what are the Raptors doing with Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi? Mm -hmm. um, and and is is there is there a deal to be made there? Because the the, the Raptors certainly are trying are, are like I think considering all options as they try to retool on the fly here and figure out who, you know, they're, they're presumably building around Scotty Barnes um, is what if Miami loses this series to the Knicks? Are, are they, are the heat in a position where they say, you know what, we got as far as we could with this Jimmy Butler thing. Would they trade Jimmy Butler? I don't know. Uh, but at least Butler's on Dame's timeline, right? You know, you put mm -hmm. these two vets together. That's a, I would, I would love to see those, those guys playing together for the next couple of years while they still have mm -hmm. something. Um, would the Nets deal Dorian Finney Smith on a lower, on a lower tier here, but Hey, for, for, the, guy, for the second overall pick, I think they not, would. <laughs> not for the second overall pick necessarily. I'm saying like, is there, I'm, I'm actually just thinking of other options. Yeah. Possibly these involving the, the pick. These, these are absolutely the kinds of players the Blazers need. What you're describing right. is all the right. conversations that is, anyone with a pulse yeah. has had. And, and I don't, I don't mean that the, over, that the, the second, third, fourth pick is necessarily for one of these guys. It may be some of these more than others, right? If it's Siakam or Ananobi or Butler, you're probably having to, to, that you're talking about that. If you're talking about Dorian Finney Smith, it might just be more of the, you know, I don't know, Anthony Simons for Dorian Finney. I, I, again, I'm just spitballing here and, and off the top of my head, and I haven't thought these all through. I'm thinking of the types of players they might want and who might be available based on circumstance. The Nets are probably keeping Dorian Finney Smith, but they also have a surplus right now of three and D wings, mm -hmm. and they're going to have to sort that out in this off season. Um, are the Cavaliers really completely locked into their big four and their big four contracts? Uh, or would Jared Allen potentially be uh, available as Evan Mobley grows into a bigger role as, mm -hmm. as a defensive anchor in the front court? I don't know. These are like thinking out loud kinds of players that they might want that you could get either through the pick itself, wherever it lands outside of one or some combination of, of Simon's other young players. And, and part of that thought process too, is just that, well, if you did decide you wanted one of the guards up top as kind of a partner for Dame and then eventually replace Dame, then, then, well, then now you're putting yourself in a position where Simons becomes expendable. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just thinking through options that they might have and, and that, that could be out there. I, you know, and again, all these players, none of them may get moved, but they're the yeah. kinds of players that I think people are going to be looking at this summer. You know, the Blazers have been tied to OG Ananobi since since last draft, really, when I think there was like yeah. a lot of thought that the, the seven pick that became Shade and Sharp was going to be in play for OG Ananobi. That was discussed somewhere. I can't remember. Um, and then and, and Mikhail Bridges is a guy, obviously, before. I mean, I think the entire league wanted to, to try to pry Mikhail Bridges away from Brooklyn, and the price has certainly yes. gone up. I think that that is probably a moot point uh, now. Um, but those are the players that the Blazers are trying to target, or those dynamic two-way uh, two way wings, and that's what the entire league is is trying is is trending toward. Frankly, the Blazers are going to probably re sign Jeremy Grant this summer. I mean, all indications are that that you know he he wants security, and that they ha they obviously have his rights to give him to give him the the longest term deal with the most money. So I feel like that is probably a foregone conclusion at this point, um, unless unless you somehow line up something better you know, through, yeah. through the trade with the draft or something like that. But that is an option that I think that you expect to be in place. Um, but yeah, I, I do, I, hearing you even say DeAndre Ayton, who is a, is obviously a good player. Um, 
you know, does address the immediate flaws facing the Blazers. If you're trading, I think that you're that's you're probably in the five, six, seven range. If you're if you're making like an eight and an eight and pick, the other thing I would say about the Blazers' options are they have other assets. Is they have other assets than this one pick. Um, they do have the twenty third pick in this draft from the Knicks from the Josh Hart trade, and then they also have future firsts that are currently encumbered to Chicago, which is just a whole mess of uh, of logistics, but. Joe Cronin insists that he can easily get out of that, presumably by using the Knicks pick. So if that were to happen, you would have future picks 24, 26, 28, 30 in play, which is very useful. But a lot of teams have those picks available. You know, Memphis, sure. Oklahoma City has more, Utah. And those are all teams that feel pretty close to ready to going all in. So, you know, if a player who needs four first round picks or five first round picks becomes available, you know, that's not to say the Blazers are going to be the only team that, that have a path to get that player. Well, yeah. Um, the ace in the hole for the Blazers is if, you know, they're going to, they're going to have probably a top four pick, right. Or right. A top four, four or five pick. Like some of these other teams have a, a, a greater cache of picks, right. But the Blazers in the near, in the near term are going to actually have probably a very high pick in this draft. And so depending on how those teams were talking about value, these prospects, um, you know, that, that's that's the potential trump card for the Blazers. And looking at the top 10, I'm just trying to think of if if somebody else below the Blazers was to jump to the top of the lottery, who else would be looking to, to trade a pick? I mean, Washington, maybe. Utah, Dallas. I mean, those are teams that feel close enough where they might want to be buyers. But, um, I mean, Portland's in a unique position in terms of its – where its reality has been the last two years, but then also with the urgency to get over the top now. Um, it's the two things that generally don't go super um, hand in hand. Yeah. Um, let me see here. What, what else did I want to get to? Uh, Howard, so you covered the Lakers. Um, you're from Northern California, so that makes you the ideal expert on the, on the series that is underway. Um, hopefully we get this out in time for people to, enjoy some some game six discourse um what have you made of these playoffs and i'm assuming specifically you're drawn to this lakers warrior series like the rest of us yeah impossible not to i mean un- unfortunately it hasn't really had like the star power is there and there's been some compelling moments but it, it's coming on the heels of warriors kings which was just electric mm-hmm. um this one feels a little bit more of a slog <laughs> Um, I blame the, the Lakers for that to a large degree, uh, you know, an older LeBron and also just, you know, a more plotting LeBron, Anthony Davis kind of uh, uh, opponent uh, as opposed to the Kings. Um, and so it's been different. Um, and I, I think the Warriors going down three to one kind of cast a pall over it a little bit because it, it sure. seemed to take a little bit of, of the intrigue out because it felt not that it's a foregone conclusion, but just like, man, there, it's just a steep climb now. Um, it, it's It's still been compelling because of the principles involved i never thought i i don't want to say i never thought it seemed very unlikely we were ever going to get lebron versus steph again after their four-year run of of finals clashes lebron goes to the to the lakers the lakers struggle to to become a you know a good enough team they break through they win their championship while the warriors are down the warriors get their feet back under them the lakers can't get their stuff together um the lakers revive themselves this year mid-season like yeah it's it's a it's it's kind of a gift that we got these guys hitting you know going head to head again at all that it's happening in the second round still kind of weird, um, and you know I I don't feel like there's a ton of stake like everybody was doing this 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 kind of legacy discussion around this they're both set they've got their rings yeah. they're both top ten all time LeBron is in the goat discussion Steph has broken the top ten by most people's estimation uh, you know there's no science to that obviously but. Um, the consensus seems to be Steph's now a top time all timer and he's got his championships and he's got, so like, there's nothing truly, truly at stake. Everybody's just trying to pad their resume at this stage. Sure. Um, and the sentimental part of me that's been covering this league for 26 years and and wants to see the all time greats still do great things before they go away. You know, it was a bummer to watch, you know, Kobe's final seasons. It was a bummer to watch Shaq bounce from, you know, after winning one more title in Miami to go, you know, Cleveland and Boston and, and, and just be breaking down the whole way. Like it's so seeing LeBron. I think, and I think Steph, the Blazers are the only team he didn't play for during that. <laughs> it's possible. Um, 
So, so I, I, I kind of want to see for sentimental reasons, one more run from each of these guys. Right. And it can only be one this, uh, uh this postseason, and they still got to get through Jokic now, whoever comes out of this series. Um, so that's, that's kind of the way I'm viewing it right now. Um, very intrigued to see if the Warriors can, can obviously win this game six tonight and force it back to, uh, to San Francisco for game seven. Um, I, 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 I have a stubborn belief in the Warriors and I understand like sometimes it's not a rational one. It's just kind of the aura of them. It's, it's hard to bet against them. Uh, on the other hand, I've always said, don't bet against LeBron. So these things are coming into conflict. Um, but, uh, but that's, that's part of what makes it intriguing. These, these are, these are two guys who um, at their best and LeBron has not been at his best. I don't know if there's still a LeBron game to be had, whether it's game six or a potential game seven. Um, it's, it's been, you know, we've had like, we've had Anthony Davis moments and we've had a Rui Hachimura game and we, had this, but I, I feel like we haven't really had the true LeBron signature game. I mean, he had that play in, in the first round against Memphis where he went like diving in the backcourt after a loose ball. And it's like, and that, those are the sort of moments that stand out from him. But I agree about this series. And the other thing I'd say is like looking at LeBron now, I covered those Lakers for four years, his first four years. And then I was not in the bubble when, when, when he was in the bubble, but with the Lakers, you had such a sense of confidence and belief in them that year because they just felt so serious about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, not everybody was as serious about it in the bubble. And, you know, the Lakers just sort of came in and just steamrolled. And I, uh, Miami was the same way, you know, but just not as good. Um, I feel kind of this way about the Lakers this year. I mean, I see the same, you know, LeBron seems to have that same level of of intensity and seriousness. Like, I kind of believe in, in them, right? My gut is... My gut is is Lakers, but then my head is like Warriors win game six and take it back to the Bay for game seven. And who knows? So um, I don't know. But I think it's actually been a really compelling series just on that front that like you have two teams that you have such a belief in or you have a lot of belief in the Warriors and then you have a lot of belief in, Bro- in LeBron. Those yeah. two things like are at odds. And I would not be comfortable, you know, having to bet my life either way, even at this point or even when the series yeah. was 3-1. Which is why I hate picking these things. Like, this, can we just can we just like sit back and just enjoy it? Like, I, no, I, I, don't, I don't. I don't know who's gonna win. I have no idea. No, no. I mean, of course not. And and that's what makes it fun. And you look. I mean, you know, we're looking at the possibility of a seven eight finals with Miami and, and the Lakers potentially. You know, or, <laughs> which, that could happen. Just would just be insane. Uh, yeah, nothing is impossible this this postseason. I did just write a, a, a piece for GQ Sports a few days ago about the this being the age of chaos in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with, you know, a six, seven and eight seed all advancing. And, and obviously there are circumstances to that, right? These were not your typical six, seven and eight seeds, um, but it's just been a very strange postseason in general and most likely is going to continue to be. Now that said, we still could end up with, you know, a number one seed in the Nuggets versus a number two or three mm-hmm. in the Celtics or Sixers. And in the end, the finals will seem like, oh yeah, this is just the norm. This is what we've always seen, right? Yeah. This, it wasn't all that weird after all. Um yeah. But th- but I do, I do think that that's a product of the play in right like the, the the advent of the play in has really sort of allowed teams that are going to be are going to be good at the end of the year to be a little more strategic with um with uh with the regular season or just creates more of a runway I mean the Lakers you know if they I mean they would have barely snuck in um and there would have been a lot more urgency down the stretch even to get to seven or eight. Because you had didn't wouldn't have had the cushion of nine ten, so you do that mid season turnaround. I don't know if without the play in, you even are able to make those moves because you don't have the same cushion to even get in. Because it was such a, a big climb for the Lakers, but their like you said, their mid season turnaround's been been tremendous. But I think we're going to keep seeing seven eight seeds advancing in the postseason in future years, just because the play in has created such a um, a different dynamic at the back end of the well. Of field. It, it's- it's given you the ability to fix stuff mid season, which is exactly what happened with the Lakers. The Lakers were broken. They, they just, and they should have, frankly, if they had just made moves like this, maybe not these exact trades, but if they had just made some sort of move to offload Russell Westbrook in exchange for a bunch of better fitting role players earlier last summer, October, mm-hmm. November, December, they never would have been so far down as to be a play in team in the first place. And the heat, it's hard to explain. There was some injury issues, but it's not totally injuries. The, the heat yeah. just had a weird season, but they were a team that had the best record in the East just a year ago. So in some respects, there's, you know, they're, they're not your typical eight seed at all. And in fact, they had the seventh best record, but lost a play in game to fall to eight. There's a whole alternate universe here where if the heat just win their play in game and stay seventh, which is where their record suggested they should be, or was where they were, then maybe the Bucks are still playing because the Hawks don't knock them out 
in the first round the way the Heat did, right? The Bucks, the Bucks stomped the Hawks. The Heat probably, I think, lose to the Celtics, or who knows? Maybe they knock out the Celtics. The Celtics have been kind of weird themselves. But but we have a different scenario. And then, you know, the Lakers, yeah, they rebuilt themselves. I don't know if the play-in is, is, is going to make it more likely that we have seven or eights pulling upsets. I think if, if we're, if we're moving into an era where upsets are more likely from the six, seven, eight, um, I think it's also because the plan has created an inducement for teams to compete, right? So there are fewer teams that have just pulled the plug either before the season even began, you know, that planned obsolescence basically, sure. or the teams that are leaning into a tank mid season. And so what happens now is everybody's trying to compete more often, which means the talent distribution is a little bit more even and we get the kind of parity we saw in the record in the uh, the standings mm-hmm. this season, and so the gap between teams, literally in the standings, between like third and eighth, third and seventh, fourth mm-hmm. and tenth, whatever those gaps, even just in terms of wins. I was talking to somebody at the league about this uh, recently, and they were saying, "Look, a four to five win difference is not statistically that significant. We don't consider mm-hmm. that to be a massive gap." Um, so even if you're winning as the quote unquote underdog with a four or five win, uh, deficit, it's not a, it's not a massive upset. The talent distribution is such that they're probably a lot closer than the standings at a glance suggest. So that to me is what's setting this up for more, uh, Mm. potential, uh, upsets in the future that plus, you know, the lottery odds, they change the lottery odds and then they introduce the play in. And those two things combined have given teams less incentive to tank more incentive to compete from opening night all the way into at least late March, early April, because if nothing else, they're chasing a play in spot. And so that means you've kept your roster in a, in a state where you're, you've got a better chance to compete. And meanwhile, here in Portland, we've watched the, the Blazers tank at the end of the year, the last two years. Uh, <laughs> but, but I will say, I mean, like to your point, I yeah. mean, the Laker, the, or did I say the, 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 Bla- the Blazers didn't, didn't really turn to that until mid March this year, when it was pretty clear that they were, you know, yeah. fading, they weren't winning games. They were trying to win. And you get to a certain point where, you know, I mean, it's unpleasant. It's, it's un, it's not fun to watch, but at a certain point, it's like, what is our best course here? You know, valiantly go down and, and miss the play in by two, two games or put ourselves in a position to actually get better this summer. And so that's, that's where, that's where they went. And that's kind of where they are now with these, these lottery odds. I will say the, 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 the amount of parity that we're, that we're seeing in the league does make me feel a little nervous about the going all in approach for the Blazers because there are so many variables and you, and you see a team, you know, even, even the Warriors and, you know, where they have Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and they're, they're older, you know, Draymond Green is older. The supporting cast isn't as good. They're going to they potentially get bounced in the second round. Um, to me, the key is how do you make your window as big as possible? How do you give yourself as many years of being in contention as possible? And that's for, if you're a team like the Blazers and Dame's now 33 it's and you have a high lottery pick and a chance to you know get that foundational piece or to pair with Shaden Sharp and Anthony Simons or you know however you look at it, going for that ten year window or that eleven year window is starting to feel smarter to me than the the two or three year window. But that's all I mean, going to depend on the yeah. lottery. There is there are no ten year windows anymore, Bill. Sure, sure. <laughs> There's I think everybody's operating on a three to five year window because. Uh, even if you've got a superstar that you think you can build around for the next 15 years, they don't stay. Um, at some point you slip up and then they want out. Uh, but yeah, point taken. I, I mean, I listened back to the premise earlier, like because of the parody, because of the state of all these teams that I was going through earlier, there is a window like, and you're right. Like you don't want it to be fool's gold on like, well, everybody's kind of average. So if we can just achieve average, we can It'll get in the chance. mix with the rest of them. Yeah. But listen, I mean, <laughs> You know, earlier this season, I was on Zach Lowe's pod and we were debating whether the Lakers should be all in and trading their future picks that they were holding on to as if they were, you know, the, the, the keys to the universe. And and I was making the case that when you have LeBron, you have to be all in. And Zach was mocking the idea of of a quote unquote puncher's chance. He's like, well, what does that mean? Puncher's chance. Oh, so you get in and you get knocked out in the first round. What have you accomplished? And you've sacrificed your future. So we went, mm-hmm. we had this debate and my feeling was. I don't know about puncher's chance, but that give yourself a chance. And I think, so I've, I've applied the same principle here consistently. Like I thought the Warriors, I never believed in the two timeline thing. And I thought even before they drafted Weissman, Moody, Kuminga, I always thought they should have traded those picks for, for immediate help. You've got an all time great in Steph. You've got a core with Steph, Clay and Draymond. Do everything possible to extend it. Stop messing around with what you're going to be in five years. Think about now. 
I thought the same thing when LeBron was in his last couple of years in Cleveland and they were holding on to a Nets pick as if it were the key to the universe. It became Colin Sexton, by the way. Um, you have to be all in when you have these guys. And while Dame is not quite at the same tier as LeBron and Steph, Dame is a, a top 75 guy and he is, mm-hmm. and he is the greatest blazer of all time. And he still has a window here. So it, again, unless and until he asks out, you should be all in on trying to, to do what you can in the present. Now, granted, there's less of a basis, less of a foundation, because unlike those teams I was mentioning, Warriors, Cavs, Lakers with these guys, there is no recent track record of success. And there's a, it's a steeper climb. But back to the puncher's chance thing. We just saw the Lakers give themselves a puncher's chance and now are a win away from the, the Western Conference Finals against the Denver team that's never made the finals. Do LeBron and Anthony Davis think they can beat Jokic? I bet they do. I'm pr- I bet they're. <laughs> I bet they're pretty confident that if they make the West, now they may not. And there's all kinds of stuff. You know, Nuggets have younger legs. They've got altitude advantages uh, for their home games. They have um, Davis Caldwell Pope. <laughs> they have the great KCP, who the Lakers never should have traded in the first place. Um, but the Lakers gave themselves a puncher's chance and are now a win from the conference final. So I don't, yeah. I don't belittle the idea of just giving yourself a shot as long as you haven't sacrificed too much of the future. Yeah. And Damian Lillard, by the way, I mean, people listening to this know this and you probably do too, but just averaged a career high in points. So I mean, <laughs> Which age, 30, age, age 32, LeBron, or LeBron, geez, I'm still in Laker mode. Age 32, Damian Lillard uh, is not, um, is not exactly in sharp decline, I wouldn't no. say. So, I mean, you're right. There is a window. Um, and you know, it just, it is going to hinge on the lottery, really what, what direction they end up going and what, and how much, how much, um, heft they have going in, into July and, 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 and June. This is the thing I would want right now, if I could get it right. The, 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 um, in, in this, in a, a dream world where you could read minds, uh, give truth serum, whatever else. I'm very, very curious to know what Dame's process, thought process is right now. Like we just saw him who's, he was at another playoff game last night. Was it Philly, Boston? He's, he's been making the rounds. He's yep. been at like, you know, I, I saw him here in Brooklyn a couple of weeks back. Yep. People obviously made a big deal about that, but he's now shown up at a couple of other playoff games along the way. Um, and it may just be that he wants to just watch some great basketball with a nice court side seat. Cause he can, and he's got the time. Um, maybe this has nothing to do with going around trying to, to scout teams or, or future homes or anything else. But um, I really wonder, I really wonder what, we're speculating on on whether they whether the the you know where the ping pong balls land, how that affects what the Blazers think, and 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 really at the end of the day, it's probably more important what Dame thinks, and we don't know that. Sure. And he'll be watching, I'm sure, with as much interest as anybody Tuesday night. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, if if they if if it comes to the point where they're going to trade him, where he asks out, those packages could be really fascinating. And I do think that the team here in my backyard in Brooklyn. Um, Certainly, given his friendship with Mikhail Bridges and given like all the surplus they now have of Suns picks, which are getting mm-hmm. seemingly more valuable by the day, uh, all their three and D guys they're you know, like they're the, the, the Nets are in a perfect position to make a big move. I don't know if it's for Dame, but um, the, the those are some of the situations that I have my my eye on the most this offseason. Sure. Um, the Nets might be the most intriguing team of the offseason, um, but there are several. Absolutely. And I. Uh... I'm looking forward to seeing Brandon Roy at the lottery, by the way, the Blazers are sending um, their, yeah. their former great Brandon Roy to reprise his role from the 2007 draft. When uh, he sat, he sat up there on the dais and they got the number one pick um, uh, that became Greg Oden, but um, nonetheless, a you know, kind of signature moment for him as a blazer. And it's going to be cool to see him because we haven't seen him really in an official capacity with the Blazers in, in a number of years. So I think that's yeah. another thing unrelated to the Blazers off season, but just something that I think fans can sort of, you know, grab hold of. Um, that's something that's going to be fun on Tuesday as well. Absolutely. All right, Howard, I have taken up enough of your time. I've taken away valuable puzzling time that I'm sure <laughs> I haven't gotten to genius yet on the, on the spelling bee today. So, you know, I need, I really do need to concentrate on that. That's going to be the rest of my afternoon possibly. You know, it might, it might seem like um, we are sponsored by the New York Times crossword app today, <laughs> but I want to be very clear. The podcast is actually supported by the Pacific Automation 147, which is coming June 2nd and 3rd to the Portland International Raceway. Howard, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come to, on Sports by Northwest um, and, and sharing your wisdom. I meant it when I said that you are one of the smartest observers of the game. And for those listening who want more of Howard, 
you can find him on various podcasts and also you can read him um in Gen- gentlemen's quarterly <laughs> gq.com um also by the way i have an authory page it's author with a y on the end so authory.com backslash howard beck all of my stuff is there my everything i've written for gq everything i wrote for sports illustrated new york times bleach report it's all there so uh go go check that out too folks please i i i, I, I appreciate it i get nothing out of that it's just a cool thing i like having all my stuff in one place so you know if, if uh if anybody had you know so just you're, you're bored you want to read the back catalog my greatest hits <laughs> whatever the hell that might be uh it's all just cuts yes exactly well thank you you want to read about stefan marbury and larry brown fighting back in 2006 it's all all right well thank you howard very much uh pleasure having you thank you listeners for tuning in sports by northwest we'll be back next week with more with more uh looks at sports in the northwest and also we'll know exactly where those ping pong balls did fall so we should come back next week for that thank you to my guest howard beck and